Japanese baseball fans ready for one more day of Major League fun. Another full house, 55,000 on hand at the Tokyo Dome. A picture perfect seed for David Ortiz and the Red Sox as they try to make it a two game sweep of the A's in the Far East. Late inning dramatics yesterday in the season opener. Brandon Moss with the game tying home run, setting the stage for Manny, who had four RBI, two in the 10th inning. And in the end, a successful return for Hideki Okajima back at the stadium he played his home games. The Tokyo Dome, the big egg. As you get your eggs and bacons re bacon ready for another day of breakfast in baseball, the Sox are still going global and they're ready to take on the A's once again bright and early. Hello everyone, Tom Karen, Ken Mock, and Jim Rice with you here at an SNHD Television Center. And that one had a little bit of everything yesterday. Jim, we talk about fundamentals. They needed those fundamentals to come back and win that game. Yes, I think you have to do fundamentals early in the game. I think you have to put a lot of pressure on the opposing team, but we did the fundamentals at the right time. A little, uh, little speed to beat out an infield single, a little bunt, a little hit and uh, action, and then finally the intentional walk sets the stage. Uh, it really was set up perfectly in that 10th inning. Textbook. I mean, you learn all this stuff in spring I mean, in spring training, and of course, you learn it in the minor leagues, and so you may as well apply it when you get to the big leagues. The game is much easier when you're able to do fundamentals. Uh, on the Oakland side, they're, they're worried about those fundamentals because it didn't fundamentally work out yesterday. Well, you don't want to give the, the other team outs, and that's what they did. Emil Brown comes up, gets a big hit. Uh, actually, the run in front of him really doesn't mean anything because the Red Sox had a two-run lead at that time. Uh, inexplicably, inexplicably. You can't explain it, you know. He, you just can't explain it. He, he's trying to go to third base. I don't know what he's doing, and he gives an out there. And then the next two hitters, Crosby and the Hanahan, come up and get hits. Uh, who knows how many runs uh, the A's would have gotten? Uh, yeah, Papelbon survives and, and gets the save. We'll talk about that and more. The uh, timely hitting, the clutch hitting, and all that. Uh, here's a look at the schedule over there in the Far East. Uh, they're already uh, underway in batting practice. Started about a half hour ago. The opening ceremony is coming up in about a half hour. The team introductions, the flower exchange. I'm guessing it'll be the last flower exchange we'll see during this major league season. The ceremonial first pitch and the game itself coming a little bit after 6 a.m. And of course, uh, the man, I don't want to call him the emperor of Red Sox Nation. We'll stick with the president. Jerry Revy joins us from the Tokyo Dome. And, and Jerry, literally a little bit of everything yesterday, but a lot of fun to watch that 10th inning come together. They make the call to walk David Ortiz and they pay the price with Manny Ramirez. Yeah, it's one of the major headaches that uh, all managers in baseball have to deal with, it seems like, when they play the Red Sox. And it's, uh, you know, whether you do put Big Poppy on base and take a chance with Manny. And, you know, last night they did it like I think probably 99% of the managers would have done in the game. Uh, probably the right thing to do. And, of course, Manny made him pay by going to the opposite field and uh, driving in a couple of runs. So, um, you know, he was the big uh, RBI guy last night. I don't think you can second-guess that move from Garen. I think it's something he had to do is what most guys generally do. And, um, you know, last night it didn't work for him. But, uh, you know, as far as the game goes, you saw a little bit of everything in the game. Uh, for, for the opener, uh, there was offense. There was some pretty good defense. There were base running mistakes, as you guys were talking about. Uh, the Red Sox did the little things well, and uh, Oakland did not. And uh, that was the difference in the game. Yeah, the other thing, too, is, you know, they lit up Papelbon pretty good last night. I mean, uh, he was throwing his fastball, and they were jumping all over it. So those extra mistakes uh, certainly helped at the end. Always great to see a young player get an opportunity and make the most of it. Yesterday it was Brandon Moss, who's still looking for his first Major League home run in North America, but he gets his first Major League homer in Japan yesterday. Sean Casey, a little banged up, probably led to his opportunity. J.D. Drew, and he steps in with a couple of big RBI, Jerry. Yeah, it's great, you know, to see a young kid come up like that. And, you know, he didn't know he was in the lineup, actually, uh, to where they were having those uh, ceremonies prior to the ball game because J.D. Drew actually went out to try to run sprints. It wasn't swinging the bat that was the problem for him. It was the running part. And when he finally got a chance to run in sprints after the ceremonies, he said he couldn't go. So, I mean, right away, Brandon Moss is in the lineup. And, uh, you know, I guess you don't get a chance to get nervous. Uh, you know, things happen so quickly for him. Uh, that swing he put on that bad changeup by Houston Street, though, was great. I mean, they wanted that ball down and away. The off-speed uh, off pitch, and uh, Street made a terrible pitch, left it inside to a left-handed hitter, and uh, Moss jumped all over it. So he had a very good night for himself last night, uh, which is great to see. And as I mentioned, he didn't have time to get nervous. He didn't know until about one minute before game time that he was in there. 
Well, he's back in there today. Uh, Dice game at Tosaka settled down very nicely yesterday, Jerry. But again, five walks, a hit batsman, much like we'll talk about with John Lester today. Those walks have to be something he'll keep an eye on. Yeah, even he admitted after the game last night that he was a little bit uptight about this start. And you can understand why. We kind of touched on it a little bit uh, yesterday where, you know, he's pitching not only opening day for the Red Sox, but pitching in front of his uh, his country folks here uh, in Japan, uh, people where he's been so popular throughout his uh, career. And uh, he was just awful in those first couple of innings. I mean, missing by a lot. Uh, very few close pitches on the corners. And when he did make a close one because he was missing so bad, umpires were not giving him the benefit of the doubt. But... You know, I expected to be out of there after three innings. Then he completely turned it around, and he pitched a very nice three innings after that. Seemed to settle down. He did not want to come out of the game. He tried to talk Francona into leaving him into the game, but uh, that's not going to happen. He had 95 pitches, so uh, that's one thing the fans here in Japan and Dice K aren't used to. You know, he wants to keep going, but you can't take that chance this early in the season. But the, the positive thing, he did get the first couple of innings turned around, uh, and that was, a, that was a good thing to see because it, the first two is as bad as I've seen him throw since he's been with the Red Sox. Jerry, as a player or broadcaster, you've been through a lot of getaway days, but I'm guessing nothing like what you're going to go through tonight. As I understand it, uh, you'll technically arrive in L.A. earlier than you leave Japan. Sort of take us through the next day or so. Yeah, yeah I, 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 you know, Tom, I, I'm so lost on this trip, I really don't know. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get myself on the plane. And then when we finally land someplace, which I know is going to be L.A., I'll just fix my clock and then... I, you know, they give you this advice of when to sleep and when not to sleep. We're supposed to sleep the first four hours and get up. And, and But you know what? The body tells you, I'm not listening to what you're doing. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to feel as lousy as I want to feel for as long as I want. So I'm just going to kind of go with the flow tonight and see what happens. All right. We'll be watching as always, Jerry. Enjoy it. All righty. Jerry Remy joining us uh, from Tokyo. By the way, Jerry and uh, Naoko Funayama in a little while are going to take us for a tour through the streets of Tokyo. If you haven't seen this one yet, you got to stick around for that. Uh, well, let's start with John Lester at the start of today. We talked about Dice K with the walks yesterday. This has been the biggest problem, John Lester. Even though he's got the great record, the great start over two years, uh, he's got to cut down on uh, nearly four and a half walks in nine innings last year. Absolutely. I'm sure the Oakland hitters have looked at his history. Uh, he averages, like you said, four and a half walks. They're going to be very patient. I mean, even last night when uh, Papelbon was pitching. They didn't chase many balls out of the zone. Uh, he threw his split finger. They didn't go out of the zone for that. Uh, I think Lester's got a tendency to throw some high fastballs. They're very aware of that. So they're going to make him bring the ball in the strike zone. And, uh, you know, as we were worried about Matsuzaka getting five innings, it's probably the same situations that happened here. Lester has not been stretched out that far in spring training. He had five outings, and, uh, you know, the, it's going to be another bullpen game today. Daisuke, yesterday, uh, they were very patient through the first couple of innings. What did you see differently as he was able to suddenly get more economical in those last three innings? Well, being a hitter, you can be very patient. Uh, I think if you're around the plate, I can be a little more aggressive as, as a hitter. But he wasn't around the plate at all. Now, with Lester, it's a different story. Here you have a left, you have a left hander, maybe a little more consistent around the plate, not necessarily throwing. Uh, his pitches for his strikes, but still he giving you an opportunity to hit those mistake pitches. But Dice K, he doesn't have anything going yesterday. And, but when he did get it going, what did you see? More fastballs? How, how was he able to start going a little more aggressively? More those? fastball, but he still threw a couple of off-speed pitches, but he was hitting his spots. He was hitting the location. Yesterday, no spots, no location. You think that Ellis home run rattled him early? I think it did. I mean, uh, it was kind of a stunner, and then the next three hitters completely out of sync. Um, not even close to where uh, Veritex glove was, yanking a lot of pitches across the strike zone, just awful. Uh, but here again, as a manager, you want to have this starter at least give you five innings, and he came back, pitched very well, threw some change-ups over, even a couple curveballs were pretty good. Yeah, 60 pitches deep after two innings, but he settled down very nicely after that and wound up going the five innings. A no decision, just the two runs allowed, and in the end, giving the manager exactly what he was hoping for in those five innings. Terry Francona now trying to lead the Red Sox to their first 2-0 start since 1999. When we come back, Jerry Remy hits the streets of Tokyo as our show continues. So Pedroia yesterday with a couple of hits, the American League Rookie of the Year, picking up where he left off as the Red Sox come from behind to win the first game of 2008. A 6-5, 10 inning win of the Tokyo Dome over the A's. Game two coming up in about an hour. Last night, right here on SNHD Television Center, Catherine Tapper and the crew were hosting a win on the road for the Boston Bruins. Their playoff drive moving on. Let's check in with them for an update on what happened. 
you very much. A big win for the Bruins last night north of the border. 6-2 is the final and five multi-point games for Bruins players last night, Gord, including three from the very young players on this team. Yeah, players that they really needed. It. Matt Lashoff stepping in on the, on the defense. David Krejci up front with Mark Savard out. Krejci was outstanding. And Milan Lucic just continues to deliver for this team in the crunch. You know, it's a game where people were counting them out again, yet again, but they came up big. And there's no question for me that a couple things happened tonight because of this win. Certainly Toronto can be all but realistically eliminated from the playoff picture. Buffalo lost tonight. They're pretty much gone. And Florida has also lost. So it's really down to a three-team race now. Boston, Philadelphia, and Washington for the final two spots in the Eastern Conference. The Bruins get back at it on Thursday, the back end of this home-and-home -home series with Toronto. They will be at the Garden. We will get you ready for that game live at 6.30 p.m. with WB Mason Bruins Face Off Live. See you then. Now back to you guys. All right, thanks, Catherine. That would uh, make it a morning, night, morning triple header as we wrap this up here today. And then on Thursday, uh, that's tomorrow night, more or less, the Bruins back in action. And Catherine with Mike Milbury and Rick Middleton at 6.30 over at our Garden Studio. 86 points for the Bruins, two points ahead of Washington as the Caps got the win last night, keeping a little pressure with six games to go. It'll be a, a tight race down to the stretch. As we heard from Jerry Remy in our last segment, he hasn't left the hotel a whole lot. But Naoko Funayama, our intrepid reporter in Tokyo, was able to coax him out of the hotel to take a little tour of the streets of Japan. The Rem Dog hits Japan. Let's check it out right now. Nesson presents Red Sox Go Global, presented by State Street. We're here at the team headquarters at the Hotel New Otani, and somebody who hasn't exactly left the hotel, Jerry Remy, is going to try and take a tour today. Are you excited or are you nervous? I'm a little bit nervous because I don't generally leave the hotel. As a matter of fact, we've been here now, what, four days? I did a little sightseeing yesterday. I saw the lobby and I saw the gift shop. I'm from the United States with the Boston Red Sox. Do you, are you familiar with baseball? Can you help me? I, I have a, to go to the Tokyo Dome to cover a Red Sox baseball game. Do you, can you give me directions? Tokyo Dome. Red Sox broadcaster. Broadcaster? Oh. Ram Dog. Ram Dog. Okay. It's called Sox Appeal. And what it is, is you get a chance to date. A man, and you can sit and talk to a man, three different men during a game, and you get to pick which man you would like. Would you like to be part of that show? <laughs> no? Would you like to be a member of Red Sox Nation? Uh, <laughs> what is it? Can I want? This is, uh, Tom Karen and Don Ocello should be here watching this demonstration because they both like to wear makeup. They probably learned something here. Looks like Ocello's head, doesn't it? You're going to have to take the train. The train? Shinjuku Station. I got to take the train. 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 I got that already, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't really know how to get there oh, other, okay. other than by the train. Sweet do bashi. Sweet do bashi. do. Do. Do you like American men? <laughs> I have one more question. Yes. Thank you for your help. Hi. I forgot my air guitar in the United States. Do you know where I can get an air guitar? Yeah. I really had a good time. I, I think the favorite part of the day, though, was the makeup. Um, demonstration because I had no clue when I walked out. I saw this bald dummy and I didn't know what he was talking about but it ended up being a makeup demonstration. It was great but this has been great and I, I want to thank you really for, for getting me out of the hotel. You're welcome. Really uh, and if, if you're going to travel with us all year maybe I, have, I might even go out in Cleveland. I don't know. <laughs> all right well let's go back to the safe let's haven go, for yeah, now. Yeah, I gotta get back. I'm starting to shake a little bit. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> all right let's go. Scary thing is that's more than Jerry's ever gotten out in Cleveland or Detroit or anywhere else. I don't know about that. I don't want to stir the pot, but Don Orsillo might be a little upset. He said it looks like Don, and then at the end he called it a bald dummy. So 
Well, maybe it was done with a little makeup on. <laughs> it always looks good, a little makeup. Uh, all right, let's talk about the game yesterday. We saw too close to come in. They both uh, struggled. Uh, Houston Street had a real rough time last year. In fact, blown saves have been an issue even back to when he was closing games for you, Ken. Well, injuries have too. I mean, back in 2006, he had 11 bone saves, second uh, most in the American League. Uh, only the pitcher in uh, Burgos in Kansas City had more. Uh, he throws a little bit across his body. And it, but that leads to uh, having good sync on the ball. He's not a power guy. He's not going to be throwing 95, 96 miles an hour. So he has to have that good control. And when you throw across your body like that, sometimes you hang your slider, which he did to Manny right there. Sometimes you leave that change up in the middle of the plate, which he did to Moss. Now, you know, Pat, remember when Derek Lowe was here, we used to talk about sinker ballers a lot. And uh, when they're tired, the conventional wisdom is they're better in street. Actually, he is better the more you use them, it seems. Yeah, last year's statistic proved out. He had 11 saves and 12 opportunities when he worked back-to-back -back days. Uh, when he's had a lot of rest, uh, the ball gets up a little bit, maybe tries to overthrow a little bit and leaves balls in the middle of the plate. Papelbon got the save, uh, but three hits, a walk there. How tough is it for a closer to be ready to answer the bell at the start of the year? Well, Papelbon is a completely different animal than and Street is. Papelbon's a power pitcher. Uh, when you go through spring training, you'd like to have enough innings where you can go ahead and build up the strength in your arm. Uh, you've got to have that arm strength, that little finish on his, on his fastball. You'd like to be throwing 95, 96, 97 miles an hour, which he does have that. But when you only have nine innings in spring training, uh, it's hard to build up that arm strength. And last year, the Red Sox protected them very well. Uh, they had him for the whole season. So I expect Papelbon to be fine. Uh, he's just going to get into that uh, routine where he gets up, throws a lot in the bullpen. They bring him in and use him during uh, the game and in consecutive days and then give him some rest and that'll that'll get his arm strength there. Interesting watching both of these guys because they're, they're kind of uh, the new breed of closers. Young guys early mid 20s being groomed to be closer whereas you used to just take a guy who was a starter and make him a closer. Oakland was kind of legendary for that but now you see guys turning into Jabba Chamberlain might be the next turning into closers in their early baseball career. Well I, I think all of baseball looked at what the Yankees had in the, in the uh, late uh, 90s and in the early 2000s with uh, Mariano Rivera games is shorten the game up you get to the eighth inning the game's just about over so uh, the value of the closer has gone up greatly and to get a guy with an arm like uh, uh, Papelbon and groom him for that particular uh, uh, position uh, means a great deal for the organization uh, as a manager you look at a game and you say uh, uh, let's see how many innings do I have to get before I can get to a guy that's almost automatic and uh, that's what they're doing with Papelbon and that's what Rivera was for the Yankees. It's a far cry from the closer by committee but it's only an hour pregame show we don't want to get into that because that's All a topic right. for another day. Uh, we'll come back as we look at two of the uh, best young closers in the game. First our just for men hold update Hideki Okajima yesterday pitching a scoreless ninth inning. He gave up a walk and a strikeout. He holds the Oakland A's and preserves the tie score, ultimately allowing the Red Sox to win the game in the 10th. He gets the win in his return to the Tokyo Dome. Just for men, hair color helps you stay in the game. When we come back, Emily Benjamin joins us from the field in Tokyo. An update on uh, Jacoby Ellsbury. How's he feeling after banging his back against that wall in the catch? Coco Crisp in the lineup today playing center field. Ready, set, set. Take a look at the big egg, the Tokyo Dome of the Red Sox getting ready to take on the Oakland A's. Uh, it is game two of a four game series, but about a week off between games two and three. Next Tuesday night, the second opening day, a 10 o'clock start Eastern time. All kinds of weird starting times for the Red Sox. Take a look at the lineups. Uh, really a completely different lineup for Oakland as for the Red Sox. The only change, Coco Crisp in center field instead of Jacoby Ellsbury. Talking about the lineup change and more. Emily Benjamin of the Boston Globe joining us from Tokyo. And uh, was this always a plan, Emily, to get Coco Crisp in the, the lineup as well? Or did this have anything to do with Ellsbury's catch banging against the wall late in the game yesterday? No, it didn't have anything to do with that catch. I mean, uh, Ellsbury did come down a little bit awkwardly. Uh, he did fall slightly um, hard on his back. But this was a plan. Terry Francona had sort of hinted to th about this to us. You know, he said, I may make a lineup change. And this is the one he, was, he meant. He wanted to get Coco Crisp in there against Rich Harden. Throws a little harder than Joe Blanton, um, who pitched yesterday. So that was sort of the plan. This doesn't really have anything to do with uh, Ellsbury's catch uh, or how his back is feeling. Speaking of backs, what about J.D. Drew? Not in the lineup again. What are they saying about him? 
Exactly. Um, he basically he tried to sort of come out um, and, uh, and and run yesterday. That was the problem. It wasn't swinging. It was running. Today they sort of said it's still not so great. They're going to try and look at the back, um, you know, do some massage, that sort of stuff, um, get him to start to stop spasming, which is, has been, I guess, the problem. Uh, it's too bad that they now have to go on a, you know, a 10-hour flight. That's not the best thing for a bad back. But as uh, Frank Kona said earlier, they can't exactly leave him here. So he, you know, has to get ready for that flight, won't be in the lineup today. They just need to give him some time to get that back better. It's just unfortunate that, you know, that had to happen minutes before the first game of the season. Although, fortunately for Brandon Moss, who got the opportunity, made the most of it yesterday. And, you know, he's a, he's a realist. You read everything he says. You listen to him talk down spring training. He knows it's going to be very difficult to find playing time with this outfield. Absolutely. I mean, I, I was really struck by, as you said, his comments last night. He said, you know, you look in the mirror, and if you ask yourself if you belong on this team, and you say yes, he said that's a lie. He said, you know, there are some great players on this team, and I think he understands what this team has planned for him. Terry Francona again made this clear today that he does need to refine his first base skills in Pawtucket. That's not something he's going to be able to do up with the big club. Um, games and wins are too valuable for him to be, you know, working on his, his first base defense. But absolutely, he's certainly doing well since he's been in the lineup, and it'll be good to give him another chance today, see what he can do again. Maybe they're not quite looking for uh, the heroics of last night, but um, you know this is a guy who who has some talent. Absolutely. Well, speaking of heroics, Emily, we all know the story of John Lester. Now, for the first time in his career, he begins the season with a major league team. He's bulked up. He's looking more confident. Clearly, the expectations are once again very high for John Lester. There's no question, and, and you could sense, I mean, last year he started the season, he was so frustrated, even though he probably deep down knew that he was not physically able to um, be on this team at the start of last season, he was very frustrated about that, and I, can, and I know this year he's much more excited, obviously, to, to be starting, and I think he feels that he belongs here, he belongs with the big club from the start of the season, and this to him is really the beginning um, of his major league career in a way. I mean, yes, he's had, you know, parts of two seasons under his belt, but he really is established as a starter. He's starting the second game of the season for the, the Red Sox, for the defending champion team. And, you know, he now is a major league starter, and there really are no questions about that. There are no questions about him, his pitching, or, um, you know, his, his illness anymore. I mean, yes, there are certainly still, um, he, he hasn't exactly, uh, he's not quite Josh Brackett yet, but he's a major league starter, and that's, what, what, what we're looking at tonight. Yeah, just as the Colorado Rockies, five and two thirds scoreless in game four. Emily Benjamin, thanks very much. Thank you. Emily Benjamin uh, getting ready for her getaway day. Everybody starting to head back to North America after this one uh, tonight. You can read about it in the Boston Globe. Tomorrow, Emily there with Dan Shaughnessy, Gordon Needs of the Globe. Bob Ryan taking a look at the Celtics game against the Suns and a sweet 16 preview. It's all coming up. And when we come back, uh, Jim Rice will tell us what a million yen means to Manny Ramirez. As Sean Casey and the Red Sox are getting ready for game two. Sean Casey didn't play in game one, still bothered by a stiff neck. Might get the opportunity to get in there today. Well, this is the hero interview. Ken Maka giving us that information yesterday. The uh, MVP of the game brought out kind of a NASCAR type podium out on the infield and Manny Ramirez was that here yesterday got a million yen that's about ten thousand dollars for the interview and for being the MVP first Red Sox player to hit four RBI on opening day since Jack Clark today Manny spoke with Nalko Funayama as he got ready for game two in Japan it's pretty wild all these people made it to Tokyo how wild is that it's great but, but you know first I want to thanks to my agent Alex Cora he was the <laughs> one who brought me here and um without him you wouldn't be here would, today without him i wouldn't be here today but um i like it you know this is this is what it's all about uh, all these people they come out to support the team and support us and, and we love it are you is this kind of a surreal experience like looking around and you know you see the american fans but you're like i'm in tokyo hey that's what Boston fans are they're all about. Sometimes we're playing in, in Toronto, Baltimore, and it's a, it, we got half of the, the stadium, Boston Red Sox, and 
you know, they're so porous and we love it. Do any of the Japanese people recognize you? Uh, a little bit, you know, but I, I like it. Yeah, you know they call you Ramirez, right? Yeah. Not Ramirez? Mm -hmm. Ramirez. Ramirez. Um, we're trying to get a, a deal, me and Alice Cora, maybe after four years to come to play with Tokyo. Oh, that'd yeah. be fun, huh? All right, hey, thank you, man. A shrewd negotiator, our sovereign bank player profile, Manny Ramirez, keeping his options open, knowing that the Red Sox have the club option for next year and the year after that, but now that he's proclaimed Alex Cora. I don't know if Scott Boris has been made aware that Alex Cora is now Manny's agent, but uh, he says maybe he'll go play in Tokyo. Uh, yesterday, the MVP, as he got off to the hot start, that was at a Red Sox destinations event being held before the game uh, today in Tokyo. You know, he's come so far as far as fitting into Boston. Just a couple years ago, it seemed every offseason, we would hear that Manny wants to be traded. Now Manny wants these two options plus four more years after that. Clearly, he has uh, found himself a baseball home here in Boston, Jim. Well, see, Red Sox have known to have characters that can play. You're speaking of a guy like Rick Burleson. You're speaking of a guy like Tiant and Bill. He was a heck of a pitcher, too, and so now you have Manny. Uh, so everybody just blends in. I mean, with, with Manny, I mean, you get the 10,000 yesterday, you get the, the printer. Now you're going for four years in Japan. Alice Corey is his agent. I mean, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, he said he used the $10,000 uh, for gas money, by the way. And he also got a color printer, as you said, as part of the deal from Rico. He said, send that right to Fenway. Right, we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on where that printer ends up. Uh, but, but he seems to be happy here. And if he's going good at the plate, that's got to just make David Ortiz that much better ahead of him. Because it was a down year last year as far as power numbers for Manny. We all know that. But he seems ready to bust back out of it this year. The numbers were down, but he went to uh, Arizona a little earlier uh, this year to get his hitting in. And, of course, you're going to compliment each other. When uh, Manny rolls, David rolls. When David rolls, Manny rolls. The Red Sox rolls. So you're complimenting each other. Uh, with Manny, you can't make too many mistakes, nor David. But yesterday was a different story with David. David had a couple of pitches that he didn't take advantage of. I think you and a guy named Fred Lynn used to sort of work off each other like that. Yes, we complimented each other, and we learned that uh, probably playing in double-A more and everything, and so we knew each other. The difference is that we played the outfield, so we knew what to do out in the outfield, too. But when it came to hitting, we really complimented each you other. You guys flip-flopped the 3-4, too. Yes, it we wasn't did. always set up as one guy 3, one guy 4. Here, David is number 3, Manny's number 4. They've fallen into that role. I didn't mind. I think once it's in your mind that the manager wanted you to do that, that's what we did, and you'd accept that. It seemed like after the first inning or after the first at bat, to me it doesn't matter anyway because your other guys behind you and be in front of you got to get hitched in order for you to come up four or five times. As long as your name was up on that That's card every, every day, day when you got into the That's clubhouse. Right. Every day. We'll take a break, come back. More as uh, we get ready for baseball in Tokyo. The season opened with an extra innings win yesterday. Now they try to make it 2-0 and oh before coming back for two more games in Oakland starting next Tuesday night. Time now for our starting ace is brought to you by Ace Tickets. Call 1-800-MY-SEATS. Last year, Red Sox got off to an 0-2 start. Now, trying to start 2-0. John Lester, 4-0 last year. We last saw him winning game four of the World Series with five and two-thirds shutout innings going up against Rich Harden, who has an ERA of 17.61 uh, against the Red Sox in his career. So Lester against Harden in game two. Gordon Eats joins us from Tokyo and Gordon uh, Rich Harden so much potential and yet only 13 starts in the last two seasons five DL trips over the last three years this guy just can't seem to stay healthy. He can and you know TC when when you reference uh, how he's done against the Red Sox maybe that helps to explain that while he's been here in town he went out and purchased an ancient samurai sword and he also talked about buying some armor. Given the way that Ortiz and Ramirez have tattooed him, I'm surprised that he held off on that purchase, gentlemen. But, you know, he's had shoulder problems. He's had oblique issues. He's had some freak stuff. But, I mean, he basically hasn't pitched the last two years. And if he could prove himself healthy, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if Billy Bean uses him as another chip in this o Oakland uh, rebuilding process. Oh, uh, yeah, the injuries will be the issue a team will have to take on. You talk about Ortiz and Manny, incredible numbers against them. Six for seven, four homers, eight RBI, three walk. The way they started yesterday, certainly Manny got off to a great start, and they've had great success against Harden. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, Harden's a power pitcher, and he'll challenge guys, and, uh, I mean, that's playing to Manny and Ortiz's strengths. I mean, Manny's four RBIs, and perhaps you guys have already mentioned that uh, this this morning. I mean, he only did that twice last year guys where he drove in as many as four runs in a game so that's a very encouraging sign 
I mean, he said he, he feels great. He's on a roll and, uh, uh, you know, ready to cash in those $100 million uh, or 100 million yen checks, I should say. Yeah, a they, million yen checks. Yeah, I was going to say, you want more four RBI games out of him, offer a million dollars and a color printer after every game during the season, and you might get better production out of him. But don't want to look ahead past this game, but after today, they travel home. You'll be coming home commercial tomorrow. Then an interesting weekend. I don't know if you can call it preseason anymore because the season has already begun, but three exhibition games, one at the Coliseum with 114,000 fans against the Dodgers. Well, and, and, it's, and it is strange, guys, that these guys, uh, the Red Sox, have ramped up for the start of the season, and now they got to ramp it back down a little bit for, for exhibition play. But, I mean, it should be a, a novelty act this weekend uh, in the Coliseum. Uh, you know, this is, the dimensions there are about as odd as any place uh, in, in years in baseball. Only 250 feet to, to left field with a 42-foot screen when the Dodgers moved there 50 years ago. Uh, what we're going to see uh, Saturday is maybe 190 feet and a screen uh, 60 feet tall. They had some of the old Dodgers reminiscing about playing in there. And, and our old friend Don Zimmer had made a bet with Duke Snyder that Snyder couldn't throw a ball over that screen and out of the Coliseum. Well, on his first throw, he hit the seat in the last row of the stadium. Second throw, he hits the back wall in the stadium. Third throw, he dislocates his elbow. So uh, that was one bet that didn't work out too well. Although apparently a couple days later, Snyder tried it again and did clear the wall. But uh, can you imagine Manny leaning up against a 190-foot fence in uh, left field? As long as there's no door out there for him to leave. Uh, <laughs> Tim Wakefield makes the start in that game. Cologne makes his start Friday, and all eyes will be on Bartolo Cologne as he tries to take another step forward. Yeah, and I mean, Tito talked about uh, the hope for Cologne is to throw 60, 65 pitches, which if he does, that means he's uh, going to be in a position very soon to uh, make a contribution to this pitching staff. You know, I haven't talked to Wake yet about the fact that he's pitching Saturday before 115,000 people. Tito said he gave him that start because he considered it an honor. I don't know, when, when that left field wall is only 190 feet away, I don't know how many pitchers would consider that an honor. After flying with the Blue Angels, a uh, short fence in left isn't too much uh, pressure for Tim Wakefield. Gordon Eads joining us. Thanks very much, Gordo. You got it, man. Gordon Eads out in Tokyo giving us the latest. Uh, you know, Bartolo Colon, an interesting wrinkle to this coming season. You certainly saw plenty of him out on the West Coast. He's hitting 93, 94 miles an hour again. If he is anything close to what he was three years ago, he could help this team a lot. Well, you're going to need seven starters at least to start the season. And uh, with Beckett and Schilling on the shelf, uh, uh, signing Cologne was big. And if you can get him into game shape, I mean, uh, the last couple of years with the Angels, he's had a lot of problems, you know. So if you can get him into game shape, that's a wild card that you can play there. And uh, it'd take the pressure a little bit off the young guy like Buckles, you know, maybe send him back down to AAA to get a little more grooming. I tried to shoot a glance over at you real quickly when we talk about that 192 foot wall over at left field. Uh, that's a short porch. It is. I, but here's the key here. The key being the left field is good for the left handers. I mean, when right handers pull the ball, they want to pull the ball in the air. So everything that you that you're trying to do as far as being a right hand hitter, everything's got to be right. But left hand hitter doesn't have to be right. Now you got pretty good at playing that green monster at Fenway Park. How about double that 60 feet high on that left field wall for the game? But you have, you, I think I have a sore neck. <laughs> you know, probably could play it, but the neck will be really no sore. No bolts, though. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, at least it takes a true hop <laughs> off that. Uh, obviously, great for baseball. It's an exhibition game, but kind of a neat thing to have 114, 115,000 people. Uh, uh, tremendous throwback. Uh, people go out and buy the throwback jerseys, but 50 years ago, playing in the Coliseum when the Dodgers went out there, would be a tremendous throwback. Wow, it's going to be like watching a Michigan-Ohio State game or something like that. Over being in Tokyo. People downtown. Being in Tokyo. That's exactly right. At the train station at 6 a.m. All right, we are getting ready to go to Tokyo right now. As you can see, the ceremony just about to begin. Jim, Ken, and I will see you after the game. But let's join the pregame festivities at the Big Egg right now.
holds the world's professional baseball record of 868 career home runs. Former Yomiuri Giants first baseman, Sadaharu O, added to his training regimen the spirit of Bushido, or the way of the samurai, in his fourth year with the Giants. Thank you very much. We dedicate this Japanese word, Tamashi, or spirit, to today's legendary game. This reminds us of an expression in Japanese baseball, one pitch, one spirit, or putting your heart and soul into the pitch.
You're watching the opening ceremonies from the Tokyo Dome live as the Red Sox and Oakland A's get ready for game two of the 2008 regular season. Starting lineups to be introduced in just a couple of moments. Of course, the Red Sox yesterday with the extra innings win, taking the season opener by a 6-5 score. First pitch of this one coming up in just about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And as you can see right now, the Red Sox and A's uh, watching it, taking it all in, getting ready for the final day of this opening season in Japan. We go back for more of the opening ceremonies right now.
And now, the National Anthem of Japan. Tonight, the Jazz Chorus Quartet, Javi Zip, will be performing the National Anthem. The National Anthem of Japan wrapping up the opening ceremonies for Game 2. Breakfast in baseball, the Red Sox go global, continues as we come back for Game 2. John Lester going up against Rich Harden. First pitch coming up. <laughs> 